Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Now this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Now I'm going to go on a limb here and say that ASA is one of the world's preeminent animal studies organisations. They do fabulous things to support animal studies scholars, but they also need your support. So why don't you think about becoming a member of ASA? Membership is just 50 Australian dollars a year. And meanwhile, while you're saving up your 50 Australian dollars, why don't you go over to their Facebook page and like it so you can see what's going on with ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Now, this episode of Knowing Animals is also brought to you by MC Pony. MC Pony is a hip-hop artist who's very interested in animal issues. She's got a fantastic website. She's also on YouTube. So if you're interested in music, if you're interested in animals... If you're interested in hip-hop, you've got to check out MC Pony. Vegan Thuz is the name of the website and you can find the link in the podcast notes. So check out MC Pony. Okay, well, goodness me, let's get down to business. It is a summer's day (coughs) in London town. It's not too cold. It's only two jackets worth. And we're sitting in an outdoor cafe in central London. So it's quite real. You're going to hear a bit of background noise, but it's nice. There's some trees around, a bit of nature. Now, I've got a very special guest. But before I introduce a special guest, I should let people know that we've also got a third person here. We've got Dr. Annette Pick sitting in, helping us out, observing everything, taking notes, pouring us coffee. But the, but the star of this week's episode is Steve Baker. Now, Steve is an artist and he's also a scholar. He's Emirates Professor of Art History at the University of Central Lancaster. He will be very well known to many listeners of this program. And today, among many other things, we're going to discuss his book chapter, Art and Animal Rights, which appeared in his 2013 book, Artist Animal. And that book was published by the University of Minnesota Press. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. Thanks, Siobhan. So, Steve, let's get down to it. Why did you write the book? Okay, um, I wanted to explore the way that artists with a commitment to animal rights produce their work, how they thought about it, um, and the, the chapter that we're kind of focusing on called Art and Animal Rights is one that allowed me to talk about the work of three interestingly different artists, uh, Sue Coe, Britta Yashinsky, and Angela Singer. And the way in which I kind of um, got into this was, it, it's quite a, a, a long history in a sense. Uh, it came out of many years of thinking about the visual representation of animals and the work undertaken by those representations. One of the first conference papers that I gave was for a small symposium in 1985 run by History Workshop. And it was called Animal Images of Sex, Race and Class. So, as you can guess, it was basically people talking about the ways in which negative images of animals were used to characterise those kind of groupings. And I gave a paper that was about the um, use of animal imagery in the British general election campaign a couple of years earlier. But at the end of that paper, I talked briefly about the idea that those negative representations of animals actually had an impact on how we think about actual living animals uh, which didn't strike me as being a particularly unusual thing to say but the other speakers um, just weren't having it I mean they they thought it was kind of I don't know they thought it was ridiculous but they, they weren't prepared to take that seriously so that was a bit of a kind of wake-up call um, and for me I mean I'd already started uh, working on my PhD PhD at that point, um, part of which was about uses of animal symbolism within social and political contexts. And I'd also already joined the BUAV, the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection, which had really kind of 
alerted me to kind of what was going on in animal laboratories and so on. Uh, so I could kind of see this issue from both sides, um, both the kind of animal symbolism side and the impact on actual animals. Um, and I kind of, I mean, I built on this in the final chapter of my first book, which came out in 1993, called Picturing the Beast, where in that final chapter, I look at what I was calling strategic images for animal rights, which were images produced within the animal rights movement that tried to kind of counter the negative uses of animal imagery in, in popular culture, which is what the rest of the book had, lo had looked at. Um, and as the 90s went on, I got more interested in the ways in which, ana art, sorry, in which artists were engaging with those issues and finding their own ways of reshaping perceptions of animals. And in a way, that's been the focus of what I've been doing for the past 20 years. Um, a bit later on, I'd like to say something about my perception of the, um, the place of contemporary art in the historical development of animal studies. But first, I'll talk more about this particular chapter called Art and Animal Rights, uh, which, as we've said, was in my third and most recent book, Artist Animal. Um, the book's title, Artist Animal, simply holds those two terms in juxtaposition. And the book's about paying attention to artists and about how artists pay attention to animals. It's about art as a form of serious inquiry into questions of animal life. And it's built around lengthy face-to-face -face interviews with a number of artists, um, with basically with the aim of giving readers a clearer sense of the voice of those artists, which I wasn't finding much evidence of, of elsewhere. Um, in the Art and Animal Rights chapter, I invite Sue Coe, who's mainly known as a printmaker and a graphic artist, to talk about her book, Sheep of Fools, which deals with the live export of sheep. The photographer, Britta Yashinsky, uh, talks about the development of the animal imagery in her photographic series called Dark. And the sculptor, Angela Singer, um, who reworks actual living animal materials, such as old tr hunting trophies that have been donated to her, she discusses um, recent examples of her use of recycled taxidermy. And my emphasis in the interviews is always on description and not explanation, asking artists to describe what they're doing, to describe their working processes and so on, rather than say, you know, what's your work about? Why are you doing it like that? And so on. Um, and some interesting stuff came out as kind of areas of common ground that emerged in what these three artists each said. First of all, their recognition of their status of artists was not at all subservient to their commitment to animal rights. It clearly wasn't about simply about getting a message across and that being the, the be all and end all of it. Um, and Sue Coe made this very clear in saying, not in the interview, but el elsewhere, she said, before art can be a tool for change, it has to be art. And I think what she meant by that was that if you're working as an artist, you've got to be familiar with the history and the techniques of the media that you're using. You've got to be able to work with those techniques, play with them, work against them, twist them around to enable you to create the kind of new perceptions of whatever your subject matter is, whether it's animal rights or anything else, um, that the medium will allow you to do. Um, all three of them agreed that what a couple of them called preachiness was to be avoided at all costs, and they also all acknowledged an extent to which they didn't always exactly know what they were doing and whether or not the work they were making would work in the way that they, they wanted it to. And there were some other surprises that came from what the, they said about their focus on the making rather than simply on the message. Uh, Sue Ko talks about the joy she experiences as the research behind her work starts to come together. And in a different context, uh, Angela Singer has spoken about what she calls the great infuriating joy of works of art that don't give up their message easily. Um, 
Singer also noted the irony of the fact that her rough handling of her materials was necessary in order to make work about how we treat animals so badly. But as she said elsewhere, if you're going to make work of this kind, work of this kind, it should be done strongly. In other chapters in the book, I write about artists who engage actively with questions of animal life, but who in some cases have what might, have what might be called a more compromised ethical agenda. And my determination to write about these artists and to take them equally seriously still, I think, baffles some of my readers. And I have a couple of observations about this. First, there are two largely distinct audiences I try to reach with most of my work. On the one hand, there's the inter interdisciplinary animal studies audiences who may actually have very little interest in contemporary art. And on the other hand, art audiences who may have little interest in animals as a subject for contemporary art. And both of those audiences matter to me a great deal. And I think there's an important question of pace here. Um, I want to contribute to building the audience for serious contemporary art that deals with animals. And if I can help to do that slowly but sustainably, that's fine with me. But it can't be done simply by ignoring established artists whose animal theme work whose animal themed work happens to be controversial in various ways. Um, to give an example, shortly after I'd interviewed Eduardo Katz uh, uh, for the book, an artist who, as you probably know, um, makes bio art projects that have not always had their intended outcome, shall we say. Another artist asked me about how Katz had defended the ethics of his work. And I explained to this other artist that I'd not raised the question of the ethics of his work in our interview. In fact, I never directly raised the question of ethics when I interview artists. There's a great essay by Isabel Stengers that's built around the assertion that there are no good answers if the question is not the relevant one. And to me, drawing out defensive answers either by challenging or even politely querying an artist's ethical stance, is seldom a, for a, a promising way to get real insight into what that artist is doing and to into that artist's practice. I guess another way of looking at this is by thinking about the whole field of animal studies and the community of animal studies scholars that now exists. I think there's something to be said for occupying the ground that the field needs, ground that's perhaps not being that's perhaps being overlooked elsewhere. And this may have been an oversimplification, but with the rise of critical animal studies, which at least some of the time involves scholars being quite explicit about their ethical stance as part of their scholarship, I think there's a corresponding need for scholarly work in the field that continues to operate by different means more slowly, more quietly, but with no less seriousness and no less determination. This is perhaps the time briefly to try and situate some of these comments in relation to the history of animal studies. When my first book came out in 93, that's Picturing the Beast, I assumed it would disappear without trace. I mean, I kind of I was aware that there were writers like Harriet Ritvo and Carol Adams who were publishing, uh, publishing work that we would now think of as being animal studies texts. Um, but I kind of, I don't know, I mean, I felt as though the book was just going to go into a vacuum. And then only months later, Ken Shapiro coined the term animal studies in the first issue of his journal Society and Animals. And all of a sudden, it kind of felt like there was a potential home for what I was doing. And it was very important for me, even though at that time I didn't know any of the people involved. Um, of course, at the start, Society and Animals had a social science focus. And in the mid-90s, a few of us lobbied hard to get Ken to extend the scope of the journal to cover humanities material as well. But even as late as the late 1990s, he tended to be rather resistant to uh, proposals that were concerned with the arts, with the visual arts in particular. Um, 
But things were changing fast. Uh, my second book, The Postmodern Animal, came out in 2000. And that was, um, I guess, the first broad survey of contemporary art about animals that had tried to articulate its significance and its seriousness. And I did uh, write briefly about both Suko and Britta Yashinsky in that book. But through great good fortune, the publication of The Postmodern Animal coincided with three really um, important and groundbreaking animal studies conferences. Uh, there was Erica Fudge's Animals in History and Culture at Bath in 2000, uh, uh, sorry, in 1999. Nigel Rothfeld's conference representing animals in Milwaukee in 2000. And Bob Mackay's Millennial Animals Conference in Sheffield in 2000. And I think from that cluster of vital conferences came the sense, for me at least, that it wasn't now just a kind of home for my work, but there was actually a community of scholars. And I really can't overestimate how important that was and has continued to be for me over the past 20 years. Um, but it wasn't until around 2007 or 2008 that it felt as though contemporary art began to gain wider recognition within animal studies. And here there were two, I think, particularly important developments. Uh, in 2007, there was the launch of Giovanni Alloy's quarterly online journal Antennae, which quickly became and remains an indispensable platform and resource for artists in the field. And in 2008, there was the first of Rosie McGoldrick's Animal Gaze Conferences in London, where I think for the first time anywhere in the world, many of members of the audience and many of the speakers were themselves artists. And uh, there's actually, there are plans for a third Animal Gaze Conference in July next year. Um, it's not been announced yet, so you've got a bit of a- Breaking news. Indeed, indeed. Um, so over the past 10 years, the animal studies field has felt like an increasingly welcoming place for artists. And again, I was incredibly lucky that this was the context in which Artists Animal was published. And that supportive context creates its own possibilities. And for me, and I'm just going to talk briefly about this, one of those possibilities was that it felt like the right moment to return to my own art practice, which had lapsed almost 25 years earlier. Throughout that time, I'd been looking at other people's representations of animals, and I wanted to figure out what exactly it was that I'd learned. I wanted to better understand other artists by putting myself in the position of actually having to make the same decisions that they were making. And I certainly don't think I'm finished with writing, but my artwork is now taking up much more of my time and my attention. And it keeps changing, of course. Over the past couple of years, animals have actually been rapidly disappearing from my photographs. And what I've got interested in are environments we share with other species, but where neither humans nor animals are actually visible in the photographs. I've been working on a series called Like Columns of Tiny Ants, which kind of alludes to the teeming life, that's teeming animal life that's there in the woodlands and the wetlands of Norfolk, where I now live, but where that animal life isn't actually visible in the, the photographs. And I've been thinking more about strategies for representing landscapes in a manner that let go of what we might call the kind of commandeering human view of the landscape. And in doing that, two of the things that have proved particularly fruitful or are proving fruitful at the moment, are the distinction that Deleuze and Guattari make in A, a Thousand Plateaus, about the, the distinction between what they call smooth space and striated space. Uh, and I'm not going to go into what that is. And, yeah, you can look that up for yourselves. Um, but along with that, the other thing that's been particularly helpful is the work that Ron Brolio did about 10 years ago now in some of his early writings about the way in which the poet Wordsworth was trying to reshape perceptions of landscape in his work in a way that actually contested the dominant understanding of what was meant by landscape. So that's kind of where things stand for me at the moment, and that's probably a good point to uh, 
to stop and take the uh, the five quick questions <laughs> that I think are coming. Well, wow, Steve, that that was fabulous. Before we get to the five quick questions, could I ask you a few follow-up questions sure. on, on what you've been discussing? I mean, one of the one of the challenges of being an animal studies scholar is that you know we're small in numbers, growing but small in numbers. So we have very interdisciplinary uh, conferences and very interdisciplinary conversations, and that can be challenging. But it's also very rewarding. And one of the things that I've observed is that fine arts tends to be really readily included in those conferences in a way that I don't see in other fields. Is it your sense that fine arts or art practice has grown up alongside animal studies as a discipline? I think the the existence of animal studies has made it um, a lot easier for artists who are working on those kinds of subjects or were interested in working on those kind of subjects partly because there's this kind of sense that actually yeah i'm not alone doing this kind of having this weird interest that nobody else seems to have people do now know about each other's work they know that they can talk about that work at conferences and on the whole get a sympathetic and interested response and i think there's a kind of um momentum that's begun to kind of happen over the past few years that really do open up a lot of opportunities for all of us who are making visual imagery or engaged in other kinds of art practice. Um, yeah, it is coming to be seen as part of the field rather than something that's uh, marginal. Mm, yeah. And so one of the things that occurred to me as I was reading your chapter and other sections of the book, which I really enjoyed was, you know, one of the framing questions you put out there is, what does art add? And I'm wondering if you could say something about the ways in which you think art has contributed to perhaps the animal rights movement or furthering animal protection or the well-being of animals in some way. Right, that's a difficult one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the... One of the advantages, although it takes um, perhaps some time to present it convincingly as an advantage, but one of the advantages of working with visual imagery is that um, you're not constrained by language, which at one sense is an advantage and another perhaps a disadvantage because... Um, oh, no, this is getting a bit... <laughs> I'm not being very coherent about this. But I think that visual imagery allows for um, a kind of directness, a kind of unexpectedness sometimes, and it can't simply be slotted into the verbal categories that can often constrain thought, if we're not careful. Um, Oh, there so was something else I was going to say which I've now completely forgotten. Yeah, so, so we have people who are both artists and also concerned about animals. Yeah. And they're, they're bringing those things together and then they're providing the community with opportunities to think or see yeah. or perceive in ways that perhaps are not accessible in other forms or perhaps they're not someone who's interested in reading or, you know, whatever else. Is, is that what you're saying? It's a different way of thinking yes. about engaging, yeah. connecting with that issue. Yeah, and the other thing which I've now remembered, I was going to say, uh, is that although it can be seen as a very controversial thing, the fact that some of these artists, including Angela Singer, for example, are actually working with animal materials and trying to work in a very respectful way with those materials, but trying to make work that is extremely challenging in itself. Um, I think it's important because there is a kind of a, a visceral immediacy to that kind of work that I think enables in itself certain kinds of work to be done by the artwork. Um, I know there are other artists who I've interviewed who... Um, take a very different view and find it um, deeply distressing that artists should use animal materials in their work, however respectfully they try and do it. They feel that it's, it's unnecessary. And I can sympathise with both of those views and respect both those views um, 
and I think it, in a way it kind of enriches the kind of debate that art that engages with animal rights um, can address by the fact that there are such differing perspectives within um, the work of artists to share, as it were, a common cause, but find different ways of engaging with and addressing that cause. Mm, wonderful. Okay, Steve, I feel ready. Do you feel ready for your five quick I questions? I feel ready. I feel okay. ready. Okay. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Okay, I'm going to cheat and have two. Um, and in a way, neither of them are exactly pro-animal scholarship. The first is not a book at all. It's Liberator, the campaigning newspaper of the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection in the mid-1980s. And that really kind of um, opened up my awareness of issues that I hadn't been aware of before and was very important to me. And the other one... Um, is animal scholarship, but it's not really kind of in any sense pro-animal scholarship. It's the essay um, best known in the form uh, in which it was published in 1980 by John Berger called Why Look at Animals, which I find a lot to disagree with in it, but I think it's a really stimulating and productive piece of writing. Um, particularly um, the early part of the essay called Animals as Metaphor as it was published in 1977 initially. Um, and the thing that I admire about that work is the fact that from the outset it sees representations of animals and the attitudes of society to animals themselves as being completely entangled. And that has been a very important starting point for me. Wonderful. So can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? Well, there was an incredibly short piece that I wrote for Liberator in 1985 about an RSPCA advertisement that seemed gratuitously to demonise the image of animal rights activist, activists. But aside from that, it would be my first book, the, uh, A Picture in the Beast, which came out in 93. Wonderful. If you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Okay, uh, again, I'm going to cheat and name two. <laughs> um, the first is Kim Stallwood, who I don't think I need to sort of say anything more about. We all know him. I, I first met him in the mid-80s. And for me, it's his commitment and his generosity and his open-mindedness that I really admire greatly. The other one is the other, the other person who's had a big impact on my work, I think, particularly in recent years, has been the anthropologist Gary Marvin. Um, and as you may be aware, uh, he, a lot of his, his anthropological research is about fox hunting, about bullfighting and subjects like that. And he's come in for a fair amount of criticism for simply for addressing those subjects. And there are people who have suggested that his work shouldn't count as being animal studies simply because of the subjects that he's engaging with. But I really admire the fact that he's doing serious ethnographic research, interviewing people involved in those kinds of activities that allows us to understand more about their thinking, um, if only to have better grounds on which to make cases against those practices. But taking seriously their thinking and um, not trying to kind of shortchange them, while at the same time refusing to say in his published work what his own stance on those issues is. And I think that's completely legitimate. Um, and it's that kind of um, scholarly integrity that I particularly admire about his work and it's also I mean his way of doing ethnographic research really has had a big impact on the way in which I approach the interviews that I did for for Artist Animal for example so yeah those are the two wonderful I mean there's millions of other people who I'd like to name check <laughs> but I can't what's the most important thing academics can do for animals take them seriously short but sweet thank you if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human-animal relationship, what would it be? I'd like to see an end to animal experimentation. Mm. Well, Steve, what are you working on next? Um, well, one thing I'm doing 
is going back to Portugal early next year to think further about how to photograph storks. Oh, okay. I don't know what I was expecting to hear, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think it was photographing storks. Well, that sounds wonderful. Well, how can people find out more about your work? Uh, most easily at my website, which is steve-baker.com. And the full CV there. There's a lot of my artwork there. Plenty to explore. Wonderful. Well, Steve, it's an absolute honour to have you on the program. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Siobhan. And uh, thanks, Anat, who's been thanks sitting Annette. here. Thanks, Anat. Quite <laughs> as well. Mouse, quite as well. <laughs> so thank you both for joining us for Knowing Animals and thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or to like us on Facebook at knowing animals. Also, don't forget to leave a review at iTunes. Reviews make it other p- easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals.